Welcome to the 14th session of Mapping Global Populism, the panel series organized by the European, European Center of Populism Studies. My name is Radoslav Valev. I study European Public Affairs at Maastricht University, and I'm currently doing an internship uh, with the European Center for Populism Studies. The CPS creates this panel series aimed at dissecting the diverse uh, manifestations of populism across the world, following the successful conclusion of our eighth session, Mapping European Populism Panels, we have embarked on a journey to explore populism be beyond the confines of Europe by expanding our panel series to encompass a global perspective aptly titled Mapping Global Populism. Our objective is to construct a comprehensive understanding of populism worldwide, featuring monthly sessions. Today, we'll have our 14th session of the Mapping Global Populism panel series. This, this session is titled Tracing the Pathways of Autocracy and Authoritarianism Across Central Asia. As a testament to our commitment to knowledge dissemination, we're going to write a panel report and share the video recording of this panel to our, on our website and YouTube channel. These resources serve as invaluable references for scholars, policymakers, and a wider audience concerned about the contemporary challenges to a global democracy posed by populist and authoritarian politics. In the ongoing journey of our panel series, we also extend our gratitude to all scholars and experts who contribute their extensive insights. With this, we would like to introduce our esteemed moderator and distinguished panelists for today's intriguing discussion. Today, our panel is going to be moderated by Dr. David Lewis, who is a professor of politics at the University of Exeter. He teaches and conducts Hello. research. Hello. I'm sorry? Sorry, Wait, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry, what happened? Should I continue? Just yeah. carry, carry on. Thank you. Today our panel is moderated by Dr. David Lewis, who is a professor of politics at the University of Exeter. He teaches and conducts research on international relations and peace and conflict studies with a focus on the politics of authoritarian states. His regional research primarily covers post-Soviet politics, particularly in Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. From 2019 to 2022, he was on a secondment as an ESRC AHRC fellow at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office in London. He's also a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute in London and was awarded, awarded an OBE in the newer honors list in 2023. Dr. Lewis completed his PhD in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics and subsequently worked in political risk analysis in the private sector. He also spent several years with the Brussels-based think tank the International Crisis Group, focusing on research programs in Central Asia and South Asia. Before joining the University of Exeter in September 2013, he was a senior lecturer in the Department of Peace Studies at the University of Bradford. Dr. Aksana Ismailbekova will be our first speaker, presenting on the topic, Clean Politics, Kyrgyzstan Between Informal Governance and Democracy. Dr. Ismailbekova is a research fellow at Leibniz Centrum Moderna Orient, her research work focuses on kinship, ethnicity, patronage, conflict, and gender in, Kyrgy in Kyrgy Kyrgyzstan. Dr. Ismail Bekova completed her dissertation at the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, Halle, Germany. Based on her PhD dissertation, she wrote her monograph, Blood Ties and the Native Sun, Politics of Patronage in Kyrgyzstan, which was published by Indiana University in 2017. She has also been a collaborator of the Basel Institute of Governance, two research projects, Informal Governance of Corruption, which was funded by the British Academy Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, and the Harnessing Informality, funded by the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. Our second speaker will be Dr. Denisa Duvanova, presenting on the topic Autocracies Past and Present in Kazakhstan. Dr. Duvanova is an Associate Professor in International Relations at Lehigh University. She received her PhD from the Ohio State University, her research focuses on the political economy, bureaucratic politics, interest group politics, and technology-enabled forms of political participation in Russia, in Eastern Europe, and also in Central Asia. Her book, Building Business in Post-Communist Russia, Eastern Europe, and Eurasia, was awarded the Hewitt Prize for Outstanding Publication on the Political Economy of Russia, Eurasia, and Eastern Europe. Dr. Diana Kudaybergenova will be our third speaker, discussing nationalizing authoritarianism in Uzbekistan. Dr. Kudaybergenova studies different intersections of power relations through the Wilson political sociology 
dealing with concepts of state, nationalizing regimes, and ideologies. Dr. Kudaibergenova received a PhD in 2015 from the Department of Sociology at the University of Cambridge. Her first book, Rewriting the Nation in Modern Kazakh Literature, deals with the study of nationalism, modernization, and cultural development in modern Kazakhstan. Her second book, Towards Nationalizing Regimes, Conceptualizing Power and Identity in the Post-Soviet Realm, focuses on the right of nationalizing regimes in post-Soviet space after 1991, with our prime focus on power struggles among political and cultural elites in a democratic and non-democratic states. Our final speaker is Ogul Jamal Yazlieva, who is a PhD researcher in international area studies at the Department of Russian and Eastern European Studies of the Institute of International Studies, Faculty of Social Sciences at Charles University. Her research interest is Central Asian studies, focusing on Turkmenistan, mass media, education policy, languages, and translation. Previously, she was the director of the RFE, RL's Turkmen service, based in Prague in the Czech Republic. She worked at the Turkmen State University as vice dean of the Faculty of Law and International Relations. She was the dean of the Faculty of International Business and Management and the chair of the Department of Foreign Languages at the Turkmen State University, Turkmenistan. Dr. Yazlieva received a Hubert Humphrey Fellowship from the U.S. Department of State in 2002 and spent a year at Penn State University working on a research project on higher education policy in Turkmenistan. Dr. Yazlieva will deliver her presentation titled Autocracy in Turkmenistan and the Role of Media in Cultivating Personality Cult. Having introduced the panelists, as a reminder, we did a Q&A session after the completion of the presentations. There, our respected participants can write their questions in the chat box or by raising their virtual hand and pose their questions in, per in person. Now, I would like to leave you with Professor David Lewis, who will present an overall view on populist authoritarianism across Central Asia and co administer the panel. Professor Lewis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks so much for the invitation today. Uh, it's great to see such an interesting panel and such an interesting topic arising. I think it's very important that we uh, start to discuss authoritarian systems across the world within this broader comparative uh, framing. Uh, and I think adding in populism to that uh, mix is really uh, very intellectually stimulating and a useful way to approach these questions. Um, I've, I've been doing research in different ways on Central Asia over uh, more than two decades. Uh, when I first went there, I worked for the International Crisis Group, part of what you might call a kind of liberal establishment, um, uh, working across the globe to promote various types of liberal values, um, and working at uh, that time on conflict prevention in particular. But I think what's interesting is to think about how the discourses have changed over two decades in relation to the concept of authoritarianism, the concept of democracy, and also towards liberal values, uh, something slightly different, of course. Uh, and that, you know, some of the big differences are that at that time, in the early 21st century, uh, there was only really one game in town, that was liberal democracy. Uh, we were still living through the Fukuyama end of history. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, the global discourse, if you like, was fairly flat. Uh, there was broad consensus on what the future political systems would look like. Um, and I think what we've seen is increasing challenges to that discourse, uh, lots more um, both legitimate and illegitimate, I suppose, uh, challenges to it, and lots more nuance, I would say, around the concept of authoritarianism uh, and indeed around democracy too. And it's worked in different ways. One has been obviously um, the rise of populism among uh, among Western democracies. Um, we've seen um, challenges to liberal democracy in its uh, homeland, if you like, in the West. But also, I think in Central Asia and across uh, these are uh, these wider regions, a more complex understanding of what uh, what these political systems do, um, and perhaps even a more nuanced understanding that that moves us on from this very almost simplistic binary between democracy uh, and autocracy uh, on the other hand. And within that, I suppose the concept of populism um, is one that might help us in some ways. Um, when I was working um, in Kyrgyzstan quite a lot during the sort of 2000s, uh, that was a time when populism was always identified with, um, with revolutionary movements, with upheaval, uh, with politics from below. 
Uh, but I think it's also worth thinking about how populism has fed into um, regime politics, into the politics of authoritarianism from above. Um, and uh, that's been a slow process, I think, in Central Asia, but one that I think we might see some reflection on from the panelists uh, going forward. Um, I think there's also been a shift in international attitudes and international context here. Um, obviously, there's always been a conditionality uh, to sort of political uh, engagement with Central Asia from the outside world, and particularly from uh, from Europe and North America. And those um, conditions, if you like, have usually been linked to some kind of geopolitical processes. Uh, in uh, the 2000s, it was the war in Afghanistan, post 9-11 movement, which uh, certainly tempered criticism towards authoritarian states and created uh, opportunities for local leaders to hedge one power against another. And now, of course, we see a similar situation um, in relation to Russia. Uh, again, a geopolitical card that regimes in the uh, the region can play. Again, part of this multi-vector foreign policy. So there's never been um, a, a very clear strategy, really, from the outside powers towards the promotion of democracy in the region. Um, and uh, I think what we've seen has always been uh, this uh, contextualization of Central Asia within a much wider context. Uh, and often a failure to engage with Central Asian states uh, in terms of their own challenges and their own uh, domestic uh, issues. Uh, and I think the a sort of third area that I think is very interesting, very important, I hope some of our panelists will look at, um, is uh, a much more engaged attitude to understanding what an authoritarian regime is, and that there are many more aspects to it than simply um, what you might call old-fashioned authoritarianism. Uh, there are informal economics, there are clan politics, there are uh, complex relations between different political groupings, there are regional politics. Uh, in other words, politics still lives on in authoritarian uh, uh, political systems, even if the, uh, the elections that take place regularly uh, are not necessarily the place where political disputes are uh, are fought over. So I think understanding the power politics of uh, political systems, even those that are not democratic, has been something that increasingly political scientists have become rather good at. Um, uh, but I think there's still a lot of work to do there. And that's where I think the research of um, uh, certainly a new generation of political scientists in Central Asia is really illuminating uh, how these systems work, and not just focusing on uh, repression, as perhaps was uh, a, a typical approach from uh, older school approaches to authoritarianism, but looking at media, looking at messaging, uh, looking at narratives, um, looking at political spin, uh, looking at economic governance and the co-optation of uh, elites in different ways, and of course, uh, a strong emphasis on, uh, in some areas at least, on uh, nationalism uh, and uh, in that context, a certain amount of populism as well. So I think what we what we are looking at now is a uh, you know a new generation of research on Central Asia, and today is a kind of um, window onto that research from some of the leading scholars on Central Asia, uh, and I think it's excellent to see uh, this much more. Uh, if you like, complex approach to understanding political systems uh, that's emerging within the literature over the last few years. So I'm going to stop there and start to bring in our um, uh, distinguished panelists. And we're going to start with uh, Aksani Malibekova. Um, and uh, each panelist will talk for 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and then we will take questions uh, at the end of all the presentations uh, so that we can have uh, have a good discussion. Thank you, Aksana. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would immediately start sharing my presentation. Do you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you okay. very well. Okay, good. Good. Um, wait. I will start from here. I wanted. Okay, so my uh, uh, title of my project has changed a little bit. It's uh, on the native sun embodiment of injustice in Kyrgyzstan. And as we know from uh, our uh, previous research that uh, Kyrgyzstan has experienced three revolutions uh, and in 2005, 10 and 20. And in all these uh, revolutions, people were uh, dissatisfied with the government. They were 
against formal governance um, and corruption. Uh, they were dissatisfied with the fraud elections or extensive uh, vote buying and intimidation. And the last one was because of mismanagement uh, during the COVID pandemic in 2020. And as a result of uh, corrupt, as a, as a, as a result of uh, October Revolution in uh, 2020, a new president came. Yeah, this time, uh, Japarov, and the previous president, Jim Bekov, was overthrown on October 15, 2020. And uh, since during uh, this protest uh, in October 2020, there were a lot of uh, political prisoners. Uh, were released, including the current president of Kyrgyzstan, Japarov. And uh, Japarov uh, became using this uh, uh, revolutionary favor uh, into his hand quickly, taking this situation into uh, his hand quickly. He became the acting president and prime minister. And uh, the current president, he started to criticize um, uh, earlier political leaders for being corrupt, the nepotism, links to criminality, mismanagement of COVID-19. And, and he instead promised that he would bring justice and claim to care for his people. And uh, of course, the, the, the progressive uh, movement, uh, pro progressive forces, they accused uh, Japarov of uh, undermining democracy by a bribery, uh, reinforcing authoritarian rule, setting up connection with the uh, to the criminal world and however um, japarov he started to take power into his hands uh, quickly so he first relied on uh, all, all the elites by providing the key positions especially he could find alliances with the opposition leaders he amended the constitution within a short period of time to increase uh, his presidential power he restricted the freedom of mass media. At the moment, he is also uh, restricting the social media, including uh, TikTok. And he took judiciary into his hand and he uh, took the direct responsibility for foreign uh, and domestic policy. So foreign experts appear puzzled by Japarov's continued kind of apparent popularity and success um, as a man of the people. And uh, I would call Japarov as a native son, um, a simple man uh, wearing several hats at the same time. And uh, he's proposing this authoritarian power. Yet his um, political qualification is always questioned. But at the same time, he's given the right to govern and seen as a legitimate ruler, mainly because of his uh, personal suffering. So I approach, uh, approach uh, my presentation that he could mobilize uh, mass support playing kind of emotions. He's uh, successful, especially uh, using his personal suffering uh, and using rhetoric and strategies of kinship. So as a result, many, uh, many Kyrgyz or citizens identify uh, uh, with him. Uh, all his uh, tragic stories that I will uh, describe um, in the following uh, uh, slides. And uh, now, I, if we uh, Google about especially Japarov, we will see a lot of interesting um, titles with regard to Japarov. Like in international media sources, what we see that there are different from prison to presidency, Japarov's victory. So. And um, and a lot of kind of questions ar arise arise why he became very popular despite the fact that he still uh, violates a lot of um, uh, rule of law. And now I would like to start from his arrest um, uh, arrest of Japarov. Um, citizens still identify with Japarov because state punished him in several ways. Uh, and uh, his life was difficult and he organized, for example, in 2013, he organized a protest in uh, nationalizing gold company Kumtur and uh, by claiming that lands gold belonged to people. And state opened a criminal case against him and as a result, he was uh, forced to leave the country. 
And he always says in his speeches that what he knows what it means to live uh, uh, in a foreign country uh, by taking the heart of millions of migrants living in Russia, for example. And he's quite good in coming back to his uh, personal um, history. Uh, when it comes to, for example, during the elections, he could uh, mobilize uh, migrations, uh, mig migrants as well. And uh, now I would like to talk about how he became the embodiment of injustice in Kyrgyzstan, how his suffering uh, really uh, uh, make him very uh, respectful for, in the opinion of uh, people. For example, he attempted suicide in order to make his case kind of public. And, uh, and he claimed that he he is try, tried to, he made or attempted to make this suicide in order to uh, find justice in this unjust, corrupt, dependent court system. And, uh, and people attach their personal experience with him. And uh, another thing, uh, here for example he many identify with japarov uh, because of his uh, human emotional suffering for example when he was in uh, in prison he lost his uh, son and parents and the state didn't allow him to attend their funeral and this was uh, something that uh, citizens would not uh, forgive uh, the state because and this injustice, this poverty, state betrayal, and uh, insensitivity over the loss of father and children, uh, uh, this uh, he uses all his uh, kind of uh, tragic uh, biography when he approached to people and and of course people perceive him as more like themselves than by other candidates, a suffering person. Uh, experience that others value and respect, and he all, uh, people would uh, always claim that he uh, he know f with his um, uh, skin what it means to live in an unjust uh, uh, kind of court system, for example. And so, as a result, what we see is that uh, his suffering, this emotional suffering, has been used uh, widely, and he, this has been translated quite well as a political capital during the elections and he uh, suffering has been cultivated uh, necessary virtue and judgment being in the future as a good president unlike others who continuously disappoint and exhaust the population uh, japarov suffering makes him worthy of citizens and this uh, he could play quite well with this um, card uh, for example he another he organized a huge um, performance by claiming that he came uh, when there was a hopeless situation. He became the hope of the nation. And he is he claims that he is the hope in a failed democracy. And he could be the source of justice because of uh, his suffering at the hands of the state. And this has been uh, well performed, performed to uh, lots of uh, uh, constituents of, uh, of Japara. And this is uh, my favorite part because um, uh, this part is interesting in many ways. Uh, once he became the president, or in the a lot of historians started to search for his ancestors uh, by claiming that he has legitimate uh, right to lead the Kyrgyzstan by going to archives and in going deep, uh, trying to see where his descendants, where, um, where his ancestors, who are they, and uh, which ancestor he is descended. And they claim that they, um, Japarov is, is a direct descendant of uh, Hans, rulers, rulers of Central Asia, by going to uh, Russian, uh, Arabic scripts, and by claiming that their great, great fathers um, back to seventh generation, they used to, especially Japarov's uh, ancestor, used to command uh, uh, great authority and the search for justice. So they claim, these historians, they claim that this uh, search for justice is in his blood, considering the fact that kinship is very important for Kyrgyz, is part of identity and uh, relatedness. 
And uh, this was another move that um, historians also played a crucial role, especially making, making him very kind of a, a legitimate kind of leader as if he, this, uh, this search for justice is in his blood. And another thing, there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, videos in YouTube who are the ancestors of Japara, where different kind of historians argue, discuss, uh, debate uh, about his genealogy, about his lineages. And it's very interesting to observe and, um, and um, how he, uh, they go in deep into this, uh, his uh, lineage uh, comes from uh, Bogo. Uh, another thing, another important aspect, uh, as I have said in my presentation, that uh, Japarov has a lot of hats, so he can play uh, wear different hats depending on the situation. So here, he when he went to the southern part of Kyrgyzstan, he decided that he is um, he decided to wear the Razakov's hat. He used to be the first secretary secretary of the central uh, central committee of the Communist Party of uh, Kyrgyzstan. So Razakov's hat. Japarov identified his fate, political goal, and mission with Razakov. And he uh, talked to his uh, villagers, uh, Razakovs, and um, distant relatives by claiming that he is the one who would continue the mission that Razakov left. So, in a way, he's uh, seeing his, his continuation with uh, Razakov as well. So, and of course, he could mobilize quite well his villagers by using this uh, lineage, kinship, um, genealogy, and uh, this idea of that he is descendant from the uh, ancestors that kept constantly uh, searching for justice. So, it, as if it is in his blood. So, he promised. And uh, so far, this has been quite successful in terms of him being very popular and even till now we can see how people are still obsessed with Japarov and and he uh, knows the language how to speak with the local people and the way how he speaks Kyrgyz language is really good especially he knows uh, he is capable of looking this uh, this uh, entering the cultural intimacy of uh, people uh, speaking uh, simple languages and um, making sure that his their voices are heard, and yeah. So and I will stop here, and uh, we can discuss further. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating, and I think we'll come back to lots of those themes about this sort of identification with a leader, which is so typical of populism question of language I thought again really interesting and this question of lineage this this history of uh, charismatic leadership which uh, again is very interesting um so we're going to move on to uh, our next speaker um and uh, we move countries a little bit as well so from Kyrgyzstan to Kazakhstan so uh, Denisa Duvanova is going to uh, present on autocracies past and present in Kazakhstan Denisa Thank you. Thank you for having me at this session. I'm going to share my uh, presentation uh, now. So uh, let me figure out how to go to the full screen very quickly. All right. Um, so um, with the case of Kazakhstan, the link between the autocratic nature of the political regime and populism is much more tenuous comparing to Japara's case. So let me first establish what are the possible sort of reasons why we might see, what, why one might see uh, Kazakhstan pivoting to this populist style of political rule. Um, so uh, if we look at what happened um, in uh, the country after the January 2022 um, protests, when um, uh, uh, President uh, Kassim Shamar uh, Takayev went on um, uh, a Zoom call addressing the uh, joint session of the uh, Senate and Majlis, um, and seemingly um, sort of called on um, this sort of agenda weighing uh, on the power of the powerful elites 
and redistributing the spoils of their uh, rule to the people. So there is a quote from uh, his January 11th uh, of 2022 uh, speech, uh, where he says that the group of powerful, uh, profitable companies emerging in the con uh, country. He also uh, mentioned uh, wealthy individuals, uh, at that point not by name. And he said, uh, quoting, I think it's time they pay their dues to the people of Kazakhstan. Takayev called for establishing a national fund for uh, collecting such debts and redistributing them back to the people. So this is sort of one possible connection one might sort of uh, see between Kazakhstan and the populist pivot. Um, we can also see that it wasn't, um, at least on the surface, just the lip service uh, to the popular um, uh, calls to the to the popular sentiment. He did follow through by um, arranging the imprisonments and trials of the perpetrate of the elite leaders who were behind uh, the January 2022 protests, and also their assets were seized. So assets of uh, those leaders and uh, their uh, associates were seized. You know, we can debate how much. Uh, of those assets were seized. Maybe with uh, Karim Masimus, we're talking about a significant amount of assets. However, when it comes to the member of Nazarbayev's family, Kairat de Balde, maybe, uh, you know, his, his net wor uh, worth is estimated as at 160 some um, million dollars and only one and a half million dollars was seized from him. So, um, so this is a possible populist connection. Um, my uh, research, um, which sort of appeared in the last year book, um, this is the, the cover of the book, Fifth Opportunist and Autocrats, uh, where I argued that, in fact, what we sort of what, what we see emerging in Kazakhstan, as well as a number of other Eurasian autocracies, is strengthening uh, an institutionalization of authoritarian state and very effective state building exercise that resulted in more agile and more uh, sort of capable state. And the mechanism that the autocrats had figured out how to balance the conflicting elite and mass interest might in fact account for the seeming populist turn that we observe in 2022. So in fact, I would argue that um, what we see with this quote unquote populist pivot of Takayev is just another iteration of the formula for maintaining st stable autocratic power that was invented and perfected during Nazarbayev's times. And this is just more recent iteration of that. So uh, the, uh, my explanation- Anita, uh, Sorry, could I just- yeah. Were you using slides? Because I can only see the first slide if you had more than one slide. Oh, uh, let me Sorry, see. just to make sure. Yes. I'm not... Yeah, that's great. That's better, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. So for, unfortunately, my full screen does not change slides for you. All right. So um, in my research, I uh, focus on something that I uh, called the re uh, regulatory authoritarian state. So this is the type of institutional arrangement that the Eurasian attack uh, autocrats had um, it, it perfected over the course of their uh, post-Soviet period. So how do they build those, um, those uh, autocratic uh, regulatory states? Um, basically, I argue that uh, one way to think about the task for the state building autocrats is the following. They need to balance the uh, demands of the particular, the particularistic demands of the elites who are essential in supporting the authoritarian rule in the face of potential popular challenge. But they also need to balance the elites demands with the, uh, with the promotion of collective goods. One way to think about it is think about sort of those kleptocratic autocrats presiding over uh, an economic pie 
And if they completely neglect the task of providing or collecting goods, the pie will be shrinking and there will be intensified competition for the economic rents that they need to divide with their needs. So they do need to invest in good economic performance, which essentially is what people want, which uh, th those are the things that benefit the national economies. Um, so I also wanted to sort of one of the uh, interesting connection to this uh, to, to this balancing act actually appears in Takayev's uh, January 11, uh, uh, 2022 speech where he says, uh, where he quotes uh, a uh, famous saying, the famous slogan um, that in 1930s uh, sort of was attributed to uh, Latin American politician Oscar uh, Benavides, who said, for my friends and everything, for my enemies, the law. And this is essentially really a good summary of how um, uh, Kazakh autocracy had balanced uh, these, uh, th th this dilemma and uh, how uh, the Kazakh autocracy had ruled uh, in the past and the present. So how do those autocrats build the regulatory states? Um, and more specifically, essentially, the question is, when do autocrats reign on corruption, uh, bureaucratic abuse, and preferential treatment of elites and prioritize good economic performance? So uh, from the autocrats dilemma, we can see that whenever um, sort of the, the regime stability is predicated on the popular support, there will be a need to rebalance the focus towards providing uh, collective goods, towards satisfying the needs of the general population and away from the, uh, from, from the elite's um, sort of interest, uh, from, from building, uh, from, from rewarding elite's loyalty with giveaways to special interests. Also, another reason to think why autocrats might rebalance their attention towards uh, sort of streamlining their uh, economic policy, improving uh, the conditions for the um, for the economy and the general in general for the population, is when uh, the, there is a threat that the overall sort of size of economic pie is going to shrink. So when they, they have fewer resources, it becomes more important to sort of to provide good conditions for sort of uh, um, endogenous economic growth so they can skim uh, the spoils. And from that sort of theoretical expectations, I have empirical expectations that I examined in my uh, recent book. So popular protests, and uh, we can think about the uh, um, January 2022 events as being a good illustration for this type of logic. So popular protests usually sort of uh, would indicate the need for streamlining, for building more uh, capable, effective, and responsive state institutions. So, uh, so this is one empirical expectation. And another empirical expectation is that when the autocrats face a declining resources, when there are uh, fewer resources in state coffers, um, they need to they they need to sort of. Um, streamline um, the government apparatus, they need to rain uh, down on um, um, uh, bureaucratic graft, abuse of office, corruption, and preferential treatment of the uh, powerful elites. So with those two empirical expectations, one way to think about what was going on in 2022 is you have the popular unrest that prompts the seeming autocratic, I'm sorry, seeming populist pivot by President Takayev. And then with the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine in February, 2022, you have sort of rising, um, rising streams of resource wealth with the rising oil prices, energy prices worldwide. Kazakhstan, Kazakh authorities get access to increasing 
resources that they can use in order to pacify popular demands without really raining down on bureaucratic abuse. So, so we have those two conflicting, uh, conflicting um, uh, sort of forces here that in fact prevented more um, uh, sort of more forceful pivot towards what one might call populism in uh, Kazakhstan, right? So we have a promise, we have some uh, symbolic results, and yet uh, we do not see sort of radical changes to, when it comes to uh, sort of fight against corruption and uh, reorienting the state institutions towards providing the public good. So, um, in if we um, so some of those dynamics um, have been explored in quality quantitative uh, research in my book where I look at the formal indicators of the uh, of the constraint on the um, uh, abusive discretionary power of state agencies. So I reason that uh, if you have formal institutions, formal mechanisms that constrain what the state agencies can do, they will behave in more uh, predictable uh, and more accountable manner. And this is the graph that shows the overtime growth in the uh, amount of those formal regulatory constraints on, on the bureaucracies. Um, and you can see that uh, in, um, you know, starting from uh, 2005, 2007, there had been a rapid expansion in that formal regulatory constraints on the actions of the state institutions, sort of state uh, administrative institutions, and much of it is driven by the ministerial orders, right? So it's really, so the ministries down from the ministerial level down to the uh, sort of execution by the street level uh, bureaucrats, this is where we see improvement in the overall uh, capacity and quality of uh, government administration. And we don't see corresponding increase in the it, uh, institutions that sit above the ministerial uh, hierarchy. Um, so th those data come from, uh, from the public source. Um, it's the Republican Center for Legal Information. And um, I have the complete data series going up to the end of uh, 2000, uh, 2018, basically through the Nazarbayev's term. And what I find in my analysis is that this mechanism of going back and forth between improve, sort of increasing the formal uh, oversight mechanisms over state bureaucrats, uh, and sort of and and, uh, and giving them more power in interpreting um, the uh, regulatory state policy, going back and forth, really corresponds to the um, fluctuation in oil revenues that Kazakhstan receives. So I start. Uh, I evaluate using using those data. I re evaluate the following hypothesis in my book in times of economic difficulties and shrinking state resources, politicians uh, will be constraining bureaucratic discretion in regulatory policy application. And, you know, I, I don't want to uh, sort of, this is this is how the data that I analyze look like. So the thick line represents the amount of oil rents that go to the state coffers. Uh, and the um, uh, sort of the, the, the lines, the, the dashed uh, lines represent different kinds of regulatory uh, documents that restrict the power of, uh, of uh, regulatory of state agencies. I analyze economic and social regulations, and I analyze different types of economic regulations uh, in not uh, in my uh, in my research. Um, I also use so um, uh, those are by different sort of authorities on this graph the legislative. Um, constraints, the legislative statutes are actually graphed on a different axis. There are much fewer legislative constraints. The legislature had not been the major force of constraining the actions of the state institutions in Kazakhstan. 
Uh, but uh, for the sake of showing how it fluctuated over time, I show that graph. And um, I have the results from, uh, from the um, uh, time series reg regression that regresses the um, uh, amount of um, oil rents, uh, um, I'm sorry, that, re uh, that regresses the amount of oil rents on the, um, um, on the number and the overall detail measured in the length, in the total length of those documents. Uh, in uh, across different categories of regulations. And I see that for the most of them, the declining oil rents actually increase um, that sort of regulatory oversight. Uh, uh, so when the rents decline the following year or the second, uh, the two years down the road, we see an expansion in regulatory detail, in the formal regulatory detail in uh, laws and bylaws in Kazakhstan, and vice versa, when the rents go uh, go up, uh, and, and um, I'm sorry, in when the rents shrink, uh, we see um, I'm sorry, when the rents increase, we see decline in those um, in those details. So uh, let me go quickly to the conclusions. Um, so, um, and those conclusions, I did not really talk much about sort of, I did not document the evidence of high capacity autocracy in Kazakhstan, but, you know, we can, uh, quickly reference, um, uh, you know, the, the ratings of regulatory quality and state capacity and Kazakhstan has emerged as, uh, a strong, very capable and they're sort of, they're well-governed, uh, autocracy at this point. Um, and this is very interesting because this increase in state capacity that is documented by the World Bank and the World Economic Forum and the other international institutions actually goes hand in hand with systemic corruption, chronism, and favoritism uh, towards the regime associates. Um, the state over the uh, course of its independent um, history had become increasingly formalistic and had used regulations heavy-handedly in order to uh, manage economic activity of the private center, uh, sector, yet those regulations are far from unbiased towards private interests. Um, we do see a pattern of this going back between discretion and constraint when it comes to the state bureauc bureaucracy that implements the uh, autocrats uh, policies. And um, uh, so I, I see this as a really good mechanism for the autocrats to form a, to, to balance uh, the demands for rent redistribution, which happens when uh, those state uh, institutions receive a lot of discretion in interpreting uh, their uh, their tasks uh, and interpreting uh, the nature of um, of um, of state policy in economic and social sphere, um, and sort of the, and when that discretion is curtailed, uh, they are forced to implement the state policy in the way the autocrats formulate it. So when oil revenues decline, and this is what sort of I uh, talked about with those empirical results. Um, uh, more specific regulations are adopted to curtail bur bureaucratic opportunism. So uh, very quickly, um, Takayev's liberalization, the signs of this liberalization under uh, Kasim Jamar Takayev can also be in, uh, e e interpreted as the rise of digital authoritarianism. So one of the major accomplishments is growing digitalization of state services. Uh, and uh, that digitalization really increased state capacity um, and efficiency. Uh, we do see a continuing use of those formal regulatory mechanisms at the level of sort of formal policy formulation. Uh, those uh, regulatory documents become more detailed uh, or uh, sort of, or they're withdrawn. Um, so that is sort of, sort of the, those mechanisms are quite efficient uh, today in uh, in uh, in pursuing the, the policy objectives. 
when it comes to something that would be indicative to uh, of a uh, sort of use of different mechanisms to balance uh, to, uh, to to balance the uh, needs of different uh, constituencies, um, there isn't really much evidence of uh, reliance on transparency, public accountability, and oversight because there continues to be restrictions on the freedom of press, and there is a continuing sort of indication that. Um, uh, judiciary is far from independent in the country. So this is where I will stop. I'm looking forward for the questions and discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Denise. That was fascinating. Uh, really interesting. These balances and balancing acts of uh, governments and how they're trying to uh increase state efficiency while not um changing the broader political system so we'll come back to lots of those questions i think um we will now move on to uh i think to ogul jamal uh yasliyeva um um because our other i think our other participant is not here at the moment is that right uh dan could have again uh so um uh, let's move on a little bit, and um, Ogle Jamal Yazlieva is going to talk to us uh, for 15 minutes, I think, on um, primarily on uh, Turkmenistan, if I understand correctly. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for having me in today's session. Let me share my screen. So... Um, Thank you again, and uh, I will present today the topic about Turkmenistan's uh, autocratic system and the role of media in cultivating personality cult. I will talk about, in general, about Turkmenistan's overview about uh, Turkmenistan and uh, uh, theoretical concepts and methodology that I use in my research, uh, in particular uh, in this um, presentation, political culture developed in independent Turkmenistan after the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, 1991. And uh, uh, I will talk about nation building narratives uh, using some examples. Uh, and then I will uh, switch to uh, cult of personality of state leaders. So we will talk about the meaning of this uh, concept and self-legitimation strategies that the uh, autocratic um, political elite use uh, uses uh, in their policies. And then uh, we will talk about uh, media central position in building the cult of personality. And I will uh, conclude with the research findings. So Turkmenistan is one of the five um, republics in Central Asia, which is uh, the most isolated in the region. Uh, and uh, the isolation policy started uh, in the early period of its independence under the leadership of the first uh, president of Turkmenistan, independent Turkmenistan, Sapan Murat Niyazov. Uh, as it is isolated, it is hard to get some statistics about. Even I here put some uh, different statistics about the population. You cannot rely on the um, on the uh statistics that provided by the um, government authorities uh the government type is presidential republic but uh, it is um, known as autocratic uh, regime um in this um sorry could i just check if you are are you sharing your screen your screen uh because yes. I can't see it. I, I don't know if uh, you, you cannot see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to try sharing again just to make sure we can see uh, it? Let me. I'm sorry. Let me. Um, screen sharing. I cannot see there. Be the bottom button at the bottom. Uh, green button. I have a green button. 
Uh -huh. Yes, sorry for that. And mm, so um, this one. Yep, if you click on uh, slideshow, I think you will get the full... We cannot see... Can you see slideshow? I think that would probably work. So uh, do you see the slides? Yes, they're quite small, but uh, mm. if you can go, yeah, click on slideshow. I cannot see... Okay, now here. Yeah, that's right. Um, slideshow, yeah. and, and here is it. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, sorry about that. No problem. Uh, now, I. So this is the outline I had mentioned about, and um, the concepts uh, that I use in my research. Um, existing uh, studies on the political system of Turkmenistan attribute a crucial role to the phenomenon of the cult of personality uh, in uh, promoting national ideology in the country's state building process during the transition period. In this process, the media plays uh, a crucial role. Consequently, in my research, I consider the relationship between media and politics in Turkmenistan and utilize the theoretical framework of authoritarian political culture and personalist regime, one man uh, rule, as well as the authoritarian theory of the press. As I uh, mentioned before, uh, we will talk more about the media's role in uh, strengthening and consolidating the authoritarian regime in this country. The study of this uh, relationship uh, covers media control mechanisms and the behavior of the Turkmen state leadership which played a crucial role in the emergence and uh, development of the suppressed media system. The media system mm -hmm. developed under the institution of leadership in Turkmen, Serdar Çalık, uh, in Turkmen society can be considered as a unique model of political culture of Turkmen society. Moreover, this model, uh, based on the concept of authoritarianism and one-man rule, plays an important role in building the cult of personality around the first uh, president of independent Turkmenistan, Sapar Murat Niyazov, and developed by the government of Gurban Guli, Berdu Muhammadov, Niyazov's successor, and his uh, son, Gurban Guli Berdu Muhammadov's son, that Sirdar uh, Berdu Muhammadov, uh, that rules the country uh, currently. Uh, So uh, the national development model that um, uh, is used in uh, the political system of Turkmenistan uh, may be explained uh, with the process of uh, recycling the Soviet system, the communist regime of authoritarian control and historical tribal uh, lifestyle. As uh, you may notice at the first uh, slide, I put the flag of Turkmenistan where there are five uh, patterns of the carpet of Turkmenistan, which is very, uh, which is used by the um, uh, government, authoritarian government to, uh, uh, to show, the, uh, the, to legitimize their uh, rules, uh, to legitimize their power, uh, um, giving the um, uh, patterns over 
the carpet that belonged to each uh, uh, provinces of Turkmenistan, five patterns of the carpet uh, corresponds five uh, provinces of Turkmenistan, which means uh, that tradition, the uh, tribal uh, history of the Turkmen people plays a role uh, in uh, developing the political system, authoritarian system uh, in this country. So recycling the Soviet system and using the historical tribal traditions is very important to understand the current situation, the current political rules uh, in this country. And uh, at the very beginning of uh, the independence of Turkmenistan, uh, the first president of uh, Turkmenistan, Sapar Murat Niyazov, mentioned uh, this um, tradition, uh, the historical uh, tradition of, uh, he promised, first of all, uh, to develop the country towards democracy, but he mentioned that he underlined that it will be uh, step by step regularly, uh, which means that uh, he underlined that every uh, aspect of life will be under the control of the state, including the media system. And in his address to Halk Maslahati, the People's Council, he underlined uh, that media will be under control. And uh, this um, promise was... Uh, uh, functioning alongside of more than 30 years uh, in the system of uh, the in the political system of uh, Turkmenistan. So uh, the media system is under strict control of the government. Um, here I would like to mention uh, again the media's role to consolidate the power, autocratic power, the uh, political uh, leadership, political elite uses uh, all channels of media, including uh, TV, including uh, radio channels, uh, print media, and uh, internet. Uh, and uh, the here I would like to show the next slide where I, uh, share uh, two um, parts about uh, the consumption of media uh, in Turkmenistan. Uh, here in the first one, media platform choices of the respondents. By the way, I uh, uh, could manage to, to, to survey using different plat platforms of social media with Turkmenistani people and some email uh, contacts uh, of the people and gathered around 60 respondents during two months of uh, survey process. And here, if you can see, TV still plays a role and the uh, authoritarian uh, government uses TV as a major platform to uh, to provide the uh, information about the policy of uh, the government. And uh, uh, among all platforms, 25, more than 25% belongs to TV. Um, and it is very important to mention about the language choices of media uh, consumption among respondents. Uh, here in the second uh, part, you can see Russia, the Russian language is uh, the biggest number, more than 50% of the respondents uh, uh, chooses the Russian language platforms uh, in the country. Uh, and uh, therefore, we now witness the propaganda of the Turkmen, not only of the Turkmen government, but the Russia's uh, 
propaganda uh, machine is uh, always very um, influential in uh, the country. Um, so uh, using these platforms um, by the authoritarian government, uh, the uh, message to the population targeted to the uh, Turkmen population. If you compare the content uh, of different platforms, let's say the TV case in the uh, broadcast in uh, mainly in the Turkmen language, but they have some channels in Russian and in other foreign languages. But uh, the um, policy of the government is targeted to the Turkmen speaking uh, population in the country and the uh, glorification of the personality of the state leaders are provided in the Turkmen language using some uh, specific epithets glorifying the first uh, leader, the first man in the government, the president using some uh, epithets, cliches, uh, phrases like Milletin Atathi, Basin Dikworthen, Father of the Nation, be healthy, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, it is very important to mention here that during uh, broadcast uh, of uh, news stories or feature stories on TV, uh, uh, this these epithets, these cliches should be repeated several times. For example, in my content analysis of the reports about, let's say, sports event, in one minute uh, report uh, of the sports event in Turkmenistan, the reporter should mention several times, six, 10 times the uh, glorification of the uh, first uh, uh, leader of the government, the president. And if in general, uh, if we talk about the media landscape of Turkmenistan, um, the literature, the academic literature, um, very, it is very little uh, coverage about the media system in academic literature, but we have uh, some uh, uh, very interesting arguments about the media system, which is um, attributed to it as repression, propaganda, and suppression. Uh, all media channels, uh, um, which is unique in Turkmenistan. All media channels are under state control. There is only one, um, one platform which is considered private, but it was uh, launched under the leadership of uh, the government and it is uh, also under strict control of the government officials. So uh, the constitution of Turkmenistan uh, reads uh, no censorship, uh, the freedom of speech is provided, but in reality, we see that all media channels are under control, including the internet, uh, which is now developing in the country, but it is strictly controlled by the government authorities. Mm, uh, 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 Dr. Yadliyev, would you be able to come towards your conclusions as we want to get okay. to the So here in this slide, I would like to show uh, the, the models, how they use uh, their uh, media uh, in order to keep, um, to create fear in the society. For example, this slide, uh, uh, Watan Havarlari uh, slide taken from screenshot from TV shows uh, in big picture uh, the um, uh, 
the wrongdoings and the final result, the imprisonment of those people who are not in line with the government policy. Or here in this picture, you can see uh, the glorification of the president uh, of Turkmenistan in all periods under the first president and the others. Uh, and here in two, two pictures, you can see um, very interesting uh, phenomenon in uh, Turkmen society uh, broadcast on TV, uh, kissing hands of the first leader or bowing before the first leader, providing some, which is not in line with the uh, with the uh, tradition of the Turkmen people. And in conclusion, I would like to mention that the authoritarian political culture takes its roots from the historical tribal uh, uh, conditions and the Soviet uh, communist regime uh, and author regime's authoritarian control. And the uh, idiosyncratic personality cult that I showed you in the previous slide, the pictures, how they use uh, the TV. Uh, and the key role of the personality of the state leader in the Turkmen society um, is uh, always promoted by glorifying uh, the first leaders uh, on different uh, platforms of uh, uh, the media. Uh, and to consolidate this authoritarian regime, uh, we see the participation of not only the authoritarian political elite by the uh, ordinary people. They accept this uh, condition because traditionally they respect their, their fathers, their family, kinship, traditions, tribal, and they used to live in that system. Therefore, they accept this system, glorifying the first leader, and therefore uh, the authoritarian uh, political culture uh, is consolidated with the support, not only by the political elite, by the common uh, population of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Turkmen society. And in this situation, alternative media is very necessary in order to influence somehow to the minds of the people in order to provide the alternative news and information about Turkmenistan and from the other countries of the world. Now I will stop here. Thank you for your attention and we can continue our discussion during our question session. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Nadia Leova. That was absolutely fascinating and a reminder of the importance of discourse, messaging, narratives, media um, in maintaining uh, these political systems. So we have... Um...